desert to our position here about 10, 20 kilometers south of the border. Allied forces, we are told, have now moved well into Kuwait, but a Saudi officer said the border area is still dangerous and that he had orders not to let anyone without military credentials to go through. He warned us that a group of people who tried to drive off the main highway and over the desert last night, we presume some journalists, had their tires shot out and that they were thrown in jail. We have no way of knowing if that story is true or just a way of us off. On the highway here this evening, we passed a convoy of about a dozen American Bradley armored vehicles. They did not appear to be returning from battle and could simply be reserve forces. We also passed about five buses, some so full that men were standing in the aisles. We suspect those buses may have been carried by the thousands of Iraqi prisoners the Allied command says it has taken, but we can't be sure. At dawn, about oh, five, six hours away now, we hope to head north into Kuwait and catch up, if we can, with what we gather are rapidly advancing battalions. Dave? Brian, are you traveling with other correspondents uh, on this mission? No, we are in a CNN group. Uh, we have uh, four other people uh, along with me. We were hoping uh, to get a border area. Uh, because of the uh, news blackout, we do not want to interfere with any military operations or endanger our own group, but we were hoping that we could get some information on what has transpired over the past 24 hours of fighting. I see. Are you able to travel on your own? Is that what's happening? Yes, we are attempting to do that, uh, but we have stuck to the main highways. Uh, we are fogged in. We have about 20 yards of visibility at this point. The sky is clear above us, and we can see the stars, and there is a gauzy moon in the uh, black Arabian night, but we have a tremendous problem with visibility here on the ground, and uh, have been told that if we try to cross over the border on our own, we may be caught and fired upon. All right, CNN's uh, Brian Jenkins talking to us by phone from Kafji, Saudi Arabia. Our coverage of the war in the Gulf will continue after this. It's Allied ground forces backed by air and sea reinforcement push farther into Kuwait. Allied commanders report dramatic successes with the offensive progressing more smoothly and quickly than anticipated. 11 U.S. troops are dead, according to the initial reports from the battlefield. Allies say more than 5,500 Iraqi prisoners were taken in the first 10 hours of the ground campaign. We now have some of the sights and sounds of the first day in the ground phase of Operation Desert Storm. Actually, it was uh, a little easier than I thought it would be, except for a couple of close rounds. It went pretty well. Everybody okay? Yeah. All right. Good. Our left wheel axle hit a mine, and it blew up. Can get the vehicle, but you ain't get the gunner. Can you describe what it was like inside the vehicle? I'm not really sure because I think I was unconscious and next thing I knew I was running and I just fell down on the deck and my head was hurting extremely terrible. And uh, next thing I knew I was sitting in the, in the medical vehicle getting attention and that's all I knew. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how, what went on after that. Um, we were the third vehicle from the convoy and I, I left wheel axle, I guess by the heavy load we was carrying, it pressed into the deck real hard and it ignited the mine. And you must feel fortunate that it wasn't worse than that. Uh, yes, I'm very fortunate. Um, it's, um, it's scary. It was a scary feeling, and I just I just finished stop shaking a few minutes ago. What's going on? Initial uh, indications uh, are, are sometimes difficult to rely on, but uh, as you've seen out here, we've taken uh, uh, a number of prisoners. In fact, uh, uh, estimates right now are certainly into the hundreds. Uh, our units have met with some resistance, uh, uh, but we've encountered those, engaged the enemy, and continue to push forward. Seeing all those EPWs come over the hill, it's a good sight. And I just hope we see more of them. What do you think of the Iraqi forces so far? 
haven't seen that much of them. What I've seen is the ones that's been laying down their weapons and walking this way. I've heard a lot of artillery fire and uh, seen a little incoming, but nothing up close and personal, so I, I don't know. Were the first hours of the assault what you had anticipated? Uh, no, not really. I expected them to have uh, more artillery. I expected uh, more incoming, and we really didn't see any. What do you think of the Iraqi forces so far? I think we beat them up pretty bad with the air war. I think they're probably pretty demoralized right now, but I don't want to underestimate them. I mean, they've still got plenty of weapons, but the West weapons systems that they can use on us. And your thoughts on standing here safe and sound in Kuwait? I don't really know how safe and sound this is, but... Uh, so far. Yeah, so far. Um, I guess this is what I get paid to do. So, that's what I'm, guess I'm doing it. Right now, I feel sorry for the people that are remaining on the enemy side because we're going to wipe them out. It's just a matter of time. We're going to walk through the country and liberate Kuwait. Now let's take a look at a few of the letters CNN has been receiving concerning the Gulf War. David. The first one from Long Island. Anything less than a total elimination of Saddam Hussein's capability of waging war against any other country would be unacceptable. Let's not forget, the writer says, he had five and a half months to get out of Kuwait, and it was his decision to invade this small defenseless country. It is my opinion that we as Americans, the writer says, should finish what we started and let our forces eliminate him from the picture. This letter comes from Conyers, Georgia, and it says the UN could now show its backbone and insist the world court hears all charges with an all-Muslim jury made up from every Muslim fashion and country, including Iraq, to show the world they know how to handle war crimes. And here's one from Atlanta. The Allied aim should be not only to liberate Kuwait, but simultaneously to convince the Iraqi army commanders that their true enemy is the butcher who is willing to allow them to be slaughtered as long as he can retain his personal power. If you have a comment or concern, you can fax it to us. That's at 404-681-3678. Richard Roth of CNN is standing by in Israel for this report. Richard. Yes, uh, Dave, uh, early today in the occupied West Bank there were shootings. One infiltrator from Jordan shot and killed a Israeli soldier, a Bedouin Arab. The gunman was also shot and killed. Bedouins serve as trackers for the Israelis, those who do volunteer for that duty. Defense Minister Moshe Ahrens of Israel suggested to CNN earlier today that Jordan could do a better job of making sure people don't slip through into Israel. In Jerusalem today, Israeli police shut down two branches of a research institute run by the city's leading pro-PLO Palestinian. Faisal Husseini blamed the Israeli authorities for carrying out a continuing war against the Palestinian people and culture. A police statement said the offices were being used not for research, but to help the PLO. As for this city's nightly attraction in Tel Aviv, the Scud, so far, quiet. Sunday night, Saddam Hussein has never fired a missile at Israel since the Gulf War started. Now, if it stays quiet, Israel may not participate as a military threat in this war. A ground war in the Middle East against a heavily armed Arab leader, and Israel is not involved militarily. I believe that for many Israelis, it's a very frustrated experience when somebody else fights uh, our main enemy, and especially, especially when this enemy uh, launches 37 Scud missiles hitting our centers of population. The Israeli armed forces are on alert, but at least for now, it appears Israel will watch this one from the sidelines. This is not our war. We were not part of this war in the past, and I don't believe that this is the time that we suddenly come in. Scuds fired by Iraq keep coming in. Number 37 arrives Saturday night, landing in central Israel. 
Israelis want to see if the Allies maintain the same rate of surveillance on Scud sites in Iraq while Kuwait is being liberated. My impression is that there will be a continuous attention paid to uh, the Scud launchers in western Iraq and the other end, as, as you know, uh, that aerial activity, which has been quite intense uh, these past four weeks, has not been sufficient to put an end to the uh, Scuds coming into Israel. An increase in Scud activity or the launching of chemical weapons by Iraq would surely increase the potential of an Israeli retaliation. That's been the message from Israel for weeks, but Saddam may want to encourage Israel into retaliating to widen the war. I think Israel's deterrence has really been affected by not reacting until now, before this war. After the 2nd of August, Israeli leaders said, one missile in Tel Aviv, we will respond with the roar that will be, put this man back 10,000 years, 37 missiles later, we've done absolutely nothing. So I'm not so sure that he believes the message anymore. But if things stay the same, one analyst feels Israel has little to gain by becoming involved. The strategic benefits that we've gained far outweigh any damages that we might have incurred, even if we don't retaliate. Israel joining the coalition might just result in the group praying. I don't believe it's a military problem to Israel to do it. The problem is a mainly political one, and we understand it. But those who favor Israel getting involved believe a second front would help the Allies divert Iraqi attention and may remove once and for all the scud threat to Israeli civilians. The Israeli cabinet met as usual this Sunday morning. The ground war was discussed. No decisions announced. Israeli leaders say they believe the U.S. has conducted a magnificent campaign militarily. They hope it continues. And the big hope in the government and on the streets is that Saddam Hussein will not be around when the war ends. But that may turn out to be some very premature thinking here. Richard Roth, CNN, reporting live from Tel Aviv. Thank you, Richard. We have some uh, new video uh, just into CNN of a Scud attack in Saudi Arabia that went into Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, a Scud that uh, crashed into a vacant lot. And obviously, it was intercepted by a Patriot missile, and uh, here are the officials uh, looking around it, some press corps people po poking at it as well. This is a Scud missile up close that crashed into a vacant lot in Riyadh during the recent... Uh, Incoming scuds into Saudi Arabia. Iraq's version of what it calls the mother of battles is far different from that of the Allies. Iraqi TV showed Saddam Hussein meeting with his Revolutionary Command Council at about the same time Baghdad radio was claiming heavy Allied casualties. Another broadcast urged Arabs to strike at foreign interests. CNN's Peter Arnett filed this report under the supervision of the Iraqi government. At some times, the war seemed near Baghdad. Air raid alerts signaled the appearance in the distant skies of multinational aircraft that have bombed the capital every day for nearly five weeks. But in fact, there has been little bombing in Baghdad today. The action is much further away, in southern Iraq and in Kuwait. Baghdad was actually at its busiest since the war began January 17th. People lined up for essentials such as kerosene for lanterns and cookers, a product still reasonably priced at around a dollar a gallon. Kerosene lines straggle all over the city. The Baghdad bus terminal was thriving, with travelers coming to and from the capital. And shoeshine boys were doing a brisk business. An air of normalcy that seemed bizarre under the circumstances, a major land war in progress just over 400 miles away. The calmness of Baghdad is deceptive. Part of it is a resignation to war and its calamities. Many veterans had gathered at a downtown coffee shop, passing the time by playing dominoes as they discussed the ground war. All said they had tuned to early morning broadcasts of the Voice of America, the BBC and other broadcasts from neighboring countries and were aware of developments. Few seemed to doubt that the odds against the Iraqi forces were almost insurmountable, but that this battle wouldn't be the end of Iraqi power. We will try again. If we are, we are defeated now, we will try again and again and again. Even though President Saddam Hussein had made a radio broadcast late morning, few in the city had heard about it. Saddam Hussein's short, emotional speech was a rallying call to his people and military to resist by any means. He called the ground war a betrayal. They betrayed everybody. But God Almighty, Allah, is stronger than everyone. 
and he is the only one who is always watching, capable of everything, the Almighty. And he will put an end to their invasion. It was the second appeal by Saddam Hussein to his people in two days. Iraqis we talked to felt that the ground war was inevitable, and some felt defeat was just as inevitable. That's a war. And I'm with you, we cannot to fight 29 uh, government and with this force, with this technology, uh, with this uh, uh, very arms and about 730,000 uh, army in the, in the Arab uh, island. But everything we can only to hurt you some. Baghdad functioned normally as a capital throughout the long Iran-Iraq war, even when hundreds of thousands were engaged in major battles just a few hundred miles away. But all we have met agree that this much more destructive war will have far greater short and long impacts on society. Peter Arnett, CNN, Baghdad. All of CNN's reports from Iraq are gathered and transmitted under the supervision of the Iraqi government. Vital to the success of the ground offensive, keeping the troops in the front well supplied, a monumental task, making sure hundreds of thousands of troops are fully prepared for battle. More from CNN's Brian Jenkins in Saudi Arabia. In the six months since American forces started moving into Saudi Arabia, the Logistics Command has offloaded some 430 ships and more than 7,000 planes from the U.S., Europe, and Asia, carrying more than 500,000 troops and millions of tons of equipment and supplies. I think without question this has been the, uh, the largest logistics buildup uh, in the shortest amount of time in the history of any armed forces anywhere. The enormous numbers of men and machines on the ground in Saudi Arabia have been funneled through two seaports and five airports. C-130 cargo planes have carried a good share of material farther north, but most of it has been hauled overland in huge convoys on Saudi Arabia's sparse system of highways using military trucks, civilian trucks, and even buses. Supplies are delivered first to large logistical bases, then transferred by each corps to the divisional level and on down to individual companies. The complications of moving so much, so far, so fast, have forced many supply chiefs to make shopping trips into cities to find items their logistics train could not deliver. It's definitely not like Vietnam that, that was set up and the system running when most of us came in. Here, everybody's coming in and the equipment's trying to catch us. The day before the Allied air campaign began, some Marines on the ground complained about shortages of everything from desert boots to tractor batteries. We get half of the stuff out here, the parts we need for our vehicles, and then the other half of the parts we can't even get a hold of because we don't have enough money to buy the stuff. Recent reports have said the Army was short on trailer trucks to carry M1A1 tanks newly arrived from Europe to their battle positions near the border. But the logistics commander for Operation Desert Storm insists the troops now have what they need to launch an offensive. There's always somebody that wants something more, but they are sufficiently uploaded and prepared to do whatever mission the president and the chairman give us. Go, let's go, move it! supply units will move up behind combat units as quickly as they can, setting up new logistics bases as close to the front lines as possible, making sure Allied fighting forces won't have to come back far to load up on the food and fuel and ammunition they'll need to keep pushing forward. Let's go get them going! Brian Jenkins, CNN in eastern Saudi Arabia. There are reports that so many Iraqi soldiers are surrendering. Allied officials are concerned the lightning allied campaign to free Kuwait could be bogged down. CNN has learned that 6,500 Iraqi soldiers have been taken prisoner by the U.S. troops. U.S. military officials say thousands of Iraqi soldiers are coming out of their foxholes and white surrender flags dot the Kuwaiti landscape. 
The French report they have taken 1,000 Iraqi prisoners and the Egyptians captured 500. U.S. military officials say if too many surrender at once, handling them could slow down the advance into Kuwait. Long lines of Iraqi POWs stretch across the desert horizon. Allied forces report dramatic early success during the first hours of the ground war. This is CNN's continuing coverage of the war in the Gulf. I'm Jonathan Mann at the CNN Center in Atlanta. I'm David French in Washington. Welcome, everyone. Saddam Hussein is promising Iraq will be victorious in the Gulf War, even as Allied military leaders offer words of cautious optimism now. As 22 hours of ground fighting near an end, CNN's Jennifer Michael reports the latest. Cheers and fears as members of the U.S. Marine 2nd Division cross the line in the sand, pushing into Kuwait with their heavy equipment, anticipating a possible showdown with Iraqi forces. Overhead, Allied aircraft provide cover. In the distance, smoke rises and gunfire pounds. Some battalions already are engaged in fighting. The Marines move on, suited in their chemical gear, hoping the strong wind will discourage Iraqis from using their unconventional weapons. The path of attack is dotted by columns of fire, oil wells ablaze. The Marines push past the first line of Iraqi defenses, meeting minimal resistance. They round up Iraqis surrendering by the hundreds, forming new lines in the sand, abandoning their trenches and their weapons and the war. All this a welcome sight for Marines who expected worse. I think they're probably pretty demoralized right now, but I don't want to underestimate them. I mean, they've still got plenty of weapons. The West weapons systems that they can use on us. As you've seen out here, we've taken uh, uh, a number of prisoners. In fact, uh, uh, estimates right now are certainly into the hundreds. Uh, our units have met with some resistance, uh, uh, but we've encountered those, engaged the enemy, and continue to push forward. Actually, it was uh, a little easier than I thought it would be. Um, you know, I'd heard a lot of optimistic reports, but um, I'm not exactly an optimist at times, so. Uh, I was uh, real pleased with how it went. I feel sorry for the people that are remaining on the enemy side because we're going to wipe them out. It's just a matter of time. The Marines push on, dodging Iraqi mines already marked by advance teams. But one vehicle hits a mine. The machine is damaged. The Marine is safe, but shaken. Oh, uh, yes, I'm very fortunate. Um, it's, um, it's scary. It was a scary feeling, and I just, I just finished stop shaking a few minutes ago. As the Marines punch deeper and deeper into Kuwait, they expect the fight may become fierce, but they're gaining ground and standing their ground. The largest force of Marines deployed since World War II has finally pushed past the so-called Saddam line into the land they are fighting to liberate. I'm thankful to be here. Uh, hopefully I'll be home soon, you know, get this over with, move on, and uh, keep on rolling from there. Jennifer Michael, CNN, reporting. Saudi officials say Iraq has fired at least three Scud missiles at Saudi Arabia since the ground war began. In each case, Patriot missiles downed the Scuds, and there are no reports of any injuries. We're going to show you some pictures taken during one of the attacks. You'll see a Patriot streaking into the night sky, a shower of fireworks, and then another Patriot. An unoccupied school building in Riyadh was severely damaged in one of the attacks. There had been a great deal of concern in Saudi Arabia that Iraq might start using chemical weapons once the ground war started, but officials say the Scuds fired today all were armed with conventional warheads. Reports continue to come in of early Allied success in the desert. Pentagon officials say U.S. General Norman Schwarzkopf is accelerating the schedule of the Allied ground assault. CNN's Wolf Blitzer is standing by at the Pentagon with more on the perhaps accelerating ground battle. Wolf. David, top U.S. officials here at the Pentagon and in Saudi Arabia say that the Allied ground offensive 
is moving ahead more quickly and smoothly than anticipated. CNN has learned that the U.S. has now taken over 6,500 Iraqi prisoners of war. And earlier Sunday morning, there was the first report of U.S. casualties, and that report said there were 11 U.S. killed in action. Friendly casualties have been extremely light. As a matter of fact, remarkably light. So far, the offensive is progressing with dramatic success. The troops are doing a great job. Defense Secretary Dick Cheney says it won't be a long, drawn-out campaign, but he warns that more serious fighting lies ahead. I think uh, it's safe to say it's gone better than expected, but this is only the first day. We still have a long ways to go, and uh, uh, I'd rather be cautious than uh, overly optimistic. British desert rats and French troops are reportedly to the west of the U.S. Army's 7th Corps and its tanks and armored vehicles moving into Iraq, west of the Republican Guard. So far, there have only been a few initial encounters with Iraq's best soldiers. U.S. Marines are moving right behind Saudi and possibly Kuwaiti troops south and west of Kuwait City. But as of Sunday evening, the capital had not been taken. Still, sources claim that objective is within sight and could be only a day or two away. Pentagon sources say that U.S. and other allied forces have not only spotted burning oil fields in Kuwait, but also buildings on fire in Kuwait City, allegedly set by Iraqi soldiers. How long will the war last? Some informed observers insist that based on the initial exchanges, it should take less than a week of combat to remove Iraqi troops from Kuwait. I think the all indications are now that it's, uh, it's the three or four days. But other observers are less confident. They warn that the most serious fighting remains, possibly including Iraqi chemical weapons. Sources say the Iraqis appear to have been, quote, totally surprised by the speed and power of the ground offensive. Said one U.S. source, they had no idea how fast we would be moving. You say the opposition is light. Is this because you have avoided a frontal confrontation with them? Are you going around or over? And is that why there's little We're opposition? Going to go around, over, through, on top, underneath, and any other way. Officials say the large number of Iraqi prisoners confirms the Allied strategy has worked. The fact that we've captured thousands of Iraqis in the first few hours of the operation is uh, evidence of the success of the air campaign, that they have been cut off from their supplies, that uh, they are badly demoralized, and that they'd rather quit than fight, and uh, that's obviously a great advantage for us. Those here at the Pentagon continue to caution that serious fighting continues, and more serious fighting lies ahead. David? Well, what do you make of the general's ability to come out from under the news lid dropped by the secretary to uh, take that little bow? Does it indicate that perhaps the news lid could be lifting soon? I think that that is a strong possibility, David. Uh, secretary of Defense Cheney made it clear last night that the U.S. and the Allies were concerned that too much reporting could endanger the Allied forces. But certainly the fact that uh, General Schwarzkopf earlier this morning Washington time uh, came out and had that news conference in Riyadh revealing uh, his uh, enthusiastic uh, optimism basically over the course of the war so far, the ground offensive, indicates that that news lid might not be as tight as it would have appeared initially. In fact, we're getting some preliminary signs that tomorrow there could be some additional briefings probably in Riyadh and maybe even here at the Pentagon, although I think we won't get all of the uh, logistical details, the deployments, the troop movements that uh, possibly will be coming later down the road. Thank you, Wolf. We'll be looking forward to the good news at least. Thank you very much. Jonathan. The Allied push into Iraq and Kuwait that's now underway involves troops from 11 nations. In some areas, Saudi soldiers are in the lead. Reporter Sandy Gall traveled with one unit as it crossed the Saudi-Kuwaiti border. At dawn this morning, Saudi troops started moving across the desert on their mission to liberate Kuwait. Hundreds of tanks and armored personnel carriers, their crews raring to go, headed for the Kuwaiti border, apparently without a care in the world. Artillery and rocket launchers hammered the Iraqi defenses. moving across the desert on the first day of the ground offensive towards Kuwait, 
just a few hundred yards up there is the berm, the big sand defences put up by the Iraqis. They've smashed away through that, and they're on their way now. Saddam Hussein's much vaunted berm, a defensive barrier of sand bridges and ditches, turned out to be an anti-climax. There was no flaming oil as threatened by Saddam, no Iraqi resistance. This was the historic moment as the great army of Saudi tanks and armored personnel carriers ground their way onto Kuwaiti soil and fanned out across the desert. One Saudi soldier's views about Saddam seemed to be typical. We will fight him, we will kill him, we will destroy his uh, army and her, his force. The operation went like clockwork, the armored columns following a prearranged plan advancing on a broad front without meeting any resistance for several miles. They passed a litter of empty shell cases and shortly afterwards a shattered heavy artillery piece. Then they crossed the highway and rolled off across the desert again. 10 or 15 miles inside Kuwait, the lead Saudi column captured their first Iraqi prisoners. A white flag flew from the top of a ridge. One soldier held out a leaflet calling on Iraqi troops to surrender. Another slightly wounded kissed one of his captors in relief. Several had been hurt in the brief battle that preceded their capture. Disarmed and their hands bound, they were led off to captivity. Most of them seemed to be glad it was all over. At least they were alive and had managed to avoid what Saddam boasted would be the mother of all battles. Sandy Gaul, ITN with Saudi troops inside Kuwait. front lines and behind the scenes, the most complete coverage of the war in the Gulf is on CNN. commander is denying reports that Marines have seized an island near the entrance to the Kuwait City Harbor, but Marine spokesmen say landing parties have been used to bring military equipment ashore in southern Kuwait. The spokesman would not say if infantrymen went along. In the northern Gulf, a joint U.S.-British armada has cleared the way for U.S. battleships to move even closer to their targets. Michael Nicholson reports from the British destroyer HMS Gloucester. This area, close to the coast of Kuwait, had been painstakingly cleared of mines by British and American minesweepers. Then, with destroyers and frigates from both navies, the convoy escorted the battleship to her battle station. Missouri served in the Pacific in the Second World War, saw the Japanese surrender. Now the enormous firepower of her 16-inch guns will force the Iraqis to do the same. She began the bombardment shortly after yesterday's ultimatum to Saddam Hussein had expired, targeting first on Iraqi installations of anti-aircraft batteries and bunkers sheltering thousands of Iraqi troops. But at dawn, with smoke from the fires along the Kuwaiti coast heavy on the sea, Missouri turned her guns on Kuwait City itself. It was timed to the beginning of the land offensive. She has been engaging a variety of targets uh, throughout the Kuwaiti coastline and littoral positions. Uh, and at the moment, uh, she's moving fire as required uh, to either support Allied movements, Allied troop movements, or the uh, positions in Kuwait itself. Warned that the land offensive could provoke the Iraqis to launch missiles with chemical warheads, all crew on deck put on their protective suits. Whether there is to be an eventual assault from the sea is something we don't know and certainly couldn't report. But the sudden arrival here of this battle group with such enormous firepower and so close to the coast is something the Iraqis could never have expected. It opens up a second front from the sea and ties down many thousands of Iraqi troops that are now desperately needed elsewhere. This is Michael Nicholson aboard HMS Gloucester off the coast of Kuwait. 
As the ground war proceeds, the Allies are trying to sort out how it might end and what happens in the region, the big region, afterward. CNN World Affairs correspondent Ralph Begleiter comes on now to report. The beginning of the ground offensive in Iraq and Kuwait has not changed the U.S. view of how Saddam Hussein could bring it to a halt. Withdrawal of forces and a public authoritative commitment from Iraq to comply with the United Nations resolutions on the Gulf. But what will happen in the Gulf after the war is still not clear. There will be different viewpoints with respect to what sort of regional security arrangements there should be, with respect to how the Arab-Israeli conflict should be solved, with respect to whether there should be arms control and proliferation regimes, with respect to questions of economic reconstru well, reconstruction. Well, ah! After Kuwait's alliance under fire with the United States, Kuwait could decide to abandon its traditional opposition to allowing non-Arab forces to be stationed on its soil. The person who has encouraged the presence of foreign forces in the region is Saddam Hussein. Now, how are we going to look at this in the future for the uh, sake of peace, security, and stability of the region? We have to certainly, undoubtedly, look into, look into it in a different context. Ensuring stability in the region will require some continuing military force to prevent an Iraqi resurgence. President Bush has repeatedly promised his Gulf allies not to leave American ground forces in the region, even if air and naval forces do remain. National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft says the U.S. expects the Arab coalition members, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, other Gulf states, and perhaps even Syria, to shoulder the ground forces burden of preserving stability. Iran will play a key role in Gulf stability. The United States has shunned dealings with Iran for more than a decade, but Secretary of State Baker is already certain the U.S. will have to talk with Iran about post-war Gulf security. Even though the U.S. has no direct lines of communication with Iran, it was among the nations which received a message from Washington right after the ground war started. The administration reassured Iran that its only goals are forcing Saddam Hussein to reverse his occupation of Kuwait and restoration of peace and stability in the Gulf region. That's intended to keep the Iranians on the sidelines, even as the war moves into what could be its final stage. David? Ralph, as this war does that, move into a final stage, is it making uh, more uh, evident the splits in the Arab world? For the moment, interestingly enough, we have not seen uh, evidence of splits in the Arab world. There, there has been a split in the Arab world from the beginning of the crisis. There were some large demonstrations a few weeks ago as the Allied bombing uh, campaign against Baghdad and the rest of Iraq uh, intensified. But the beginning of the ground war does not appear to have intensified the split or made it more obvious. In fact, uh, it may be too early to say, but it's possible that at this point, even most of the Arab nations realize that uh, the end game is here. Saddam has given up all opportunities to negotiate a settlement and uh, the, the war is now underway. Ralph Begleiter at the State Department. Thank you once again. We'll be back with more after this. Well, it seems to me, I mean, the main uh, source of information still is uh, the network and uh, CNN. Uh, I mean, uh, more than that, uh, we are just uh, receiving information about further destruction during the uh, last few hours. I mean, uh, several public building hotels have been burned, uh, shot by uh, artillery weapons of Iraqis in a sense of revenge and, uh, I mean, uh, trying to uh, really, I mean, follow the scourge of earth, uh, I mean, which uh, Saddam Hussein has been known uh, to like. We have conflicting reports and not a confirmation that Allied forces have taken uh, uh, Feklaka Island, that island uh, 12 miles off the coast of Kuwait City, that strategically important island. Have you any new information about that? Well, no, not at all. I mean, uh, there are only sketchy information about it. There is no uh, confirmation from neither, uh, I mean, our uh, government or uh, from independent sources. What do you think, sir, the role of the UN will be in the next few days? I know uh, there was a meeting uh, late last night at the uh, Security Council. What do you see happening that would be most helpful? 
Well, it seems to me, I mean, the uh, uh, interim reports will go on by uh, countries uh, participating in the coalition. Uh, for example, yesterday, uh, I mean, the United States of America presented an interim report. Others might uh, present uh, tomorrow. But uh, any other role, uh, I mean, uh, we are not expecting because this operation has been authorized by Security Council. And as far as it has not uh, achieved its goal, Therefore, Security Council does not have anything except to review uh, I mean, and listen to the reports by uh, uh, members of the coalition. You perhaps saw the report earlier by, by the British with the, with the Saudi forces as they were advancing uh, to help liberate your country. There are so many countries involved in all of this, and I know we've heard expressions of gratitude today from your ambassador to Washington. I wonder if you'd like to add to them. Well, uh, my uh, I mean input will be that uh, I mean this is a United Nation uh, I mean operation, and it is a pride for the United Nation uh, to I mean be associated to a liberation of a country. Uh, the founding father of the United Nation I mean when they have drafted the uh, charter, it was uh, among the noble co uh, goals in their mind that uh, use of force to preserve lasting peace. Here we are, the United Nation has fulfilled its goal to preserve lasting peace by virtue of using force. Uh, regrettably that Saddam Hussein did not let I mean, this uh, conflict to be settled uh, peacefully. Uh, therefore, any uh, casualties or damages uh, I mean, uh, will uh, be the responsibility and the responsibility should go to, to uh, the Iraqi leadership. And from the swiftness of the line of battle, are you pleased with this day? Well, definitely we are very much pleased, but also I am uh, appealing that, uh, I mean, a little bit uh, cautious uh, and emotion should be, I mean, exercised because this is a battle we just started and uh, who knows uh, what uh, will be facing us in the coming few days. But if we take an example, what we were expecting during the first day uh, and compare it to the reality now, we are in the right course and the course which has been well planned, therefore the gratitude and the the thanks and the appreciation goes for each and every member uh, who participated in this noble cause of preserving lasting peace. Mohammed Abu Hassan, the Kuwaiti ambassador to the United Nations, we thank you. Thank you. Jonathan. Kuwait's army is inexperienced but eager, eager to be on the front lines in the war to free its homeland. And it does have special training in hand-to-hand -hand combat that may now be needed to take Kuwait City from the Iraqis. Here's CNN's Pat Neal. <laughs> These are the few, the proud, the Kuwaitis. You'd never confuse them with the U.S. Marines. These rookies are part of a force that carries more political punch than military muscle. Yesterday's student is today's soldier and eager to be on the front line. We want to be the first people who go into Kuwait and liberate Kuwait. They trained in the specifics needed for freeing their homeland. Hand-to-hand -hand combat when they meet Iraqis on Kuwaiti streets. Specialized instruction in taking prisoners of war. Small weapons training. Their lives could depend on stripping and reassembling weapons, even in total darkness. And they've learned how to free captive countrymen. Some enemies, they will be hiding in the houses. And how to get in the house and take them out from the house. 18-year-old Khaled al-Ajlan wants to free his family and his home. I'm prepared to do anything for my country. Are you prepared to die? Yeah. These civilians turn soldier in four short weeks. Days crammed full of working out and pumping up patriotic pride. So far, the Egyptian military has trained more than 2,000 Kuwaiti volunteers to join their brothers in liberating their country. These troops don't know when they'll ship out for Saudi Arabia. They'll join the new Kuwaiti army, which hopes to have 30,000 men. Some who just months ago were accountants, lawyers, bankers, and students, including the emir's nephew, who's ready for the ultimate. I would like to be faced by 10 Iraqis. Take what I can, and they'll take me. But when I take some of them, that's it. I would say I liberated Kuwait. I helped in liberating Kuwait. They are few, they are proud, and they are determined to return home, house by house, if they have to. Pat Neal, CNN, in the eastern desert, Egypt. Activity at this point? Yes, we have. During the artillery barrage, we saw fighter planes 
streaming overhead, going north, seeking out those artillery positions of the Iraqi forces and hoping to knock them out. Uh, there seems to be very strong coordination between the ground forces and the air forces, but not a great deal of air activity, I have to say. We saw these uh, F-18 Hornet attack jets looping around in the air, going back a uh, second and third time to seek out their targets, and that did seem to quiet artillery fire somewhat. So I think the Iraqis are aware that when they open up their guns, they're opening themselves up to attack from the air. All right, our thanks to Brian Jenkins. Stay safe, Brian, traveling with the uh, Allied forces that drives into Kuwait.